Hello and welcome to our first episode of 2023. So before we go any further, let me, Nick Bailey, on behalf of the entire podcast team, start by wishing you a very happy new year. And did you realize that we're now into our third year of the U3A radio podcast, which on our YouTube channel has already garnered almost 100,000 views. We also have several thousand more listening on different podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, and Google. In this episode, which is number 26 in the series, we have a Northumberland theme where we'll hear about a project at Hadrian's Wall to celebrate the recent 1900th anniversary of its construction. And this is a, a, a really dynamic event, at least I hope it's going to be a dynamic event, just showcasing the richness of the talent of U3A. And we decided to set it at the wall because it was, the, it was an anniversary. The wall was built in 122. And we find out what happened before the Lindisfarne Gospels. So my question will be, how did we get there? What went before? Um, I'll be looking at the very earliest ones. And although we think of these manuscripts as Anglo-Saxon, they, they, their origin is actually in Ireland. We'll also be talking to a man who designed face masks during the pandemic. And we'll have a tour of the Royal Coin Collection. What must be the most the famous coins in, in the Royal Collection are the proposed coins for Edward VIII, who abdicated. The coins would have gone into production after two weeks when news broke of the impending abdication. As we know, the U3A caters for all sorts of interests. At Farnham U3A, there's a course which is particularly aimed at encouraging men into the kitchen. And during the winter term, they gather at a local school with ingredients at hand to learn new skills. Joanne Watson joined them as leader Pat Thorns laid out the plans for the evening's class. First of all, the order tonight, I can see that you're very keen and you've started on the vegetables. In fact, we'll be starting with the fridge cake. That then has to sit for a period of time before you finish it. So beginning and ending with the fridge cake. In the middle, we'll be doing the frittata. And I'll just say to you, it's an extremely easy dish to do. Um, and then when you finish, you wash up, which reminds me that last week, several things were left out and we had to find a home for them. And it's important that the kitchen looks pristine when we leave. So Pat, what, what's the idea behind this class? I think they thought that in U3A, there might be a number of men living alone possibly through widowhood, who would really find it helpful to learn how to cook. Um, in fact, I'm not sure that there is anybody here who's not got a wife at home who is very delighted when they take home <laughs> a full dinner and pudding. <laughs> so what, what do you start them on? Because we're partway through the course now. We started the first week with a vegetable soup and some cheese scones and learning techniques like chopping onions and rubbing in <laughs> fat. <laughs> How good are these guys? They are good. I mean, what they take home with them each week looks delicious. Some are faster than others, some are more confident than others, but they all get there in the end, and the stuff looks good. One chap emailed me last week by half eight to say he went in had absolute loads of compliments for his wife for his very first meal ever that he'd ever cooked. <laughs> so, Colin, why are you here? Because I need to learn to cook. Because every time I cook anything for Elaine, she just throws it in the air and says, this is rubbish. I've always wanted to do a cookery course, and this one's just happened to come up, so that's why I'm here. Now, you've mentioned that your wife hasn't been overly complimentary up to now. What, uh, what are you actually aiming to sort of surprise her with tonight? Anything edible. Anything that tastes nice and looks very, very nice as well. But it'd be nice to be able to help in the kitchen anyway. Greg, oh, you're, you're melting some butter. So we better keep an eye on that. Why are you doing this? My wife's getting fed up with cooking, so I thought I might try and uh, do a little bit in the kitchen as well. Um, so I'm uh, trying to learn a few recipes and do some, and we can then share a bit more evenly the cooking. What sort of level would you put yourself at? Oh, complete beginner. <laughs> 
Now, Michael, I can see you're being very precise, measuring out some chocolate. I'm just trying to work out what that is, whether it's a decimal place for an ounce. I think it is. I only need one ounce. What level of uh, cuisine are you capable of? Yes. I retired eight years ago with one of the firm intentions to go to a cookery class as soon as I retired. I only just got round to it. My children tease me about my signature dishes. I can do a limited amount of varied cooking. What is your signature dish? Well, I do chicken and leek and uh, with mustard. It's, it's lovely, actually. I can do a spaghetti bolognese. Actually, I do quite a lot. Yeah. yeah. And what are you hoping to learn specifically on well, this course? We've got a, a series of 18 uh, you know, lessons. There's going to be a lot I learn. Even last week we did a chicken casserole. I thought I could do that. I picked up so many useful little tips. It's a female touch. <laughs> so I've come down into the corner. And Jonathan, I think you're a bit behind your fellows today. Yeah, this is my first week. Uh, I'm actually looking after my wife at the moment. She's not very well at all. So I've been getting pre-prepared food and heating it up and doing a great job with that. But uh, So this kind of was a bit fortuitous. I used to cook when I was um, a lot younger, when I had a flat, because I worked out that cooking was easier than doing the washing up, and you got off earlier if you did that, so, uh, yeah. And what, what are your ambitions, then, rather than just putting something in the oven? No, you know? no serious ambitions, just so I can, you know, when Sue gets back to health, maybe I can do a couple of nice dishes a week or something like that, so nothing, nothing okay. serious. Yep. That's pretty serious. I'm sure your wife yeah, will be delighted. Yeah, well, I'm doing them all at the moment, and the shopping and everything, but, uh, yeah. It's looking good, isn't it, that yeah, one? Yeah, very good. I think you were the first to finish, Chris, aren't you? Well, they didn't call me speedy for nothing. <laughs> How much cooking do you do at home? Uh, not, not a great deal. I can cook, though. I can cook most things, but I've learned in the three weeks I've been here definitely something each week. Yeah. I think what I noticed looking around is that it's sometimes actually paying a lot of attention to what the recipe actually says. Yes. The mistake I made is adding the icing sugar with the butter and the chocolate. I should have added it after. But that's the mistake for tonight. No, it's great fun. So how do you reckon it's gone, Pat? A few, a few mistakes, I noticed, but lots of sort of rescue acts by you and your, your friends. Yeah. I find it um, absolutely wonderful to watch everybody cracking on and, you know, doing this. And yes, there were one or two errors, but we saved them. You know, I think everybody enjoys it very much. I do. <laughs> Sounds as if there's far less pressure than the Great British Bake Off, helped, no doubt, by the calm presence of Pat Thorns. By the way, we're always on the lookout for unusual groups, so don't hesitate to let us know what you're up to by emailing communications at u3a.org. Dot UK. With the recent 1900th anniversary of the building of Hadrian's Wall in 122, U3A has decided to have an event called Off the Wall, a festival of learning and fun on Wednesday the 10th of May, which will centre in and around the wall in Northumberland. Anne Keating, U3A trustee for Scotland and a member of Edinburgh U3A, told Sarah Goodall how this anniversary is being marked to showcase the activities of the U3A. And this is a, a, a really dynamic event, at least I hope it's going to be a dynamic event, just showcasing the richness of the talent of U3A. And we decided to set it at the wall because it was, the, it was an anniversary. The wall was built in 122. But um, so we decided we'll, we'll, the, you know, the wall would be a great place to be. And the wall is a, is a centre for inspiration. It's inspired music books, novels, all sorts of things. So we thought it would be an ideal place to get people together, to get U3A members together, to come and showcase their talents, what they can do, the musicians, the, the drama people, uh, the artists, the photographers, the geologists, the astronomers, to come up and, and do workshops and uh, just demonstrate their talents and what they can do. And the whole idea is to raise awareness of the U3A, to develop a stronger voice. I think it's a, it's a secret society, and certainly in Scotland it is. We've only got 12,000 members in Scotland. So we want people to know about it because it's a wonderful organisation that really um, keeps people inspired intellectually, physically, socially. And it's an organisation that should be supported and we should let the world know about it. And it's quite nice to get people coming up to the north of the country because so often U3A things are done down in the south. So let's get the southerners up north and they can experience the beauty of the wall. It's actually the countryside is gorgeous.
What is the structure of the event, of the festival itself? Well, for example, we've got one group, it's a Shakespeare group, and they are going to come up to the wall and they are going to perform a Shakespeare play at the wall. Hopefully their U3A will fund them because we don't have any money at the present moment in time. So hopefully the U3A will fund them and uh, they will make their way up and perform on the day on the 10th of May. This is just, So it's a one day festival? Well, it's a one day festival where people are there, where there is a, a face to face event. But we thought because it's going to be, I think, a big event, we thought we'd have a lead up to it. So I've, I'm organising people to do online talks. For example, Alan Matheson from Edinburgh Archaeology Group, online across Scotland Archaeology Group. He's going to do an online talk in the week leading up to the event. Um, I'm hoping to get other people who are just going to it can you know, create interest so people can listen to the online um, events, the online talks, online lectures. Hopefully it will inspire them to, to come on up. And then that will lead up to the 10th of May where people are there present at the wall. So is it is it out of doors? Some of it will be out of doors, some of it will be indoors. So it's going to take, um, to, it'll be two parts. There'll be a formal part and we've got people who are going to come and talk about, you know, professionals, uh, professors are going to come and talk about the history of the wall. And that will be inside. We've rented space at the SIL Discovery Centre, um, very near, in, in the middle of the wall, very near Vindolanda. And so we, we've hired rooms and space there. And then the outdoor events, we've, we're actually going to have um, some tent things, marquees. For in case the weather is not so good. So people performing outdoors, if it gets a bit windy, a bit wet, they'll have some some shelter. So a mix of two, the more, more formal lectures in the inside of the sill and the fringe event, as we like to call it, outside with the musicians and artists and photographers are all going to be doing their thing in, in this particular area called the sill. And where we're going to have a group of uh, crime readers and they're coming up. And there's a, an author called Louise Ross. And she's well worth Googling or reading. And if you are aware of some of her work, you can maybe contribute to a discussion um, on crime writing based on the wall. The essence of this of this event is members of the public are going to be um, invited. It will be open to members of the public. Yes. Because yes. this is your, as you started by telling us, that this is a way of raising the profile of the U3A mm -hmm. as well. But that's saying, this look at the diversity of the groups yes. that um, you could join if you in, in a U3A. It sounds if you've got already got five or six local U3As involved, you could end up with hundreds of people. Yes, but there's lots of space for hundreds of people. <laughs> it's it's, uh, no, it's a, a very big wall. <laughs> So there's lots of room for people to come along and get engaged. And I think the, the other thing about it is so often we, we work in silos. You know, you've got a small U3A in Oban, another U3A down somewhere else, and they're all doing their own thing. This is a chance for U3As to meet, to get together, mm -hmm. to, to spark ideas off one another. To, to you know, it's, I think it's very it's wonderful when people get together. I think this is where the ideas happen. And you might find two archaeology groups who think, oh, gosh, I'm going to work together with that person you know, when I get home. Or you might find people doing an art project and they think, oh, I'd like to work on that together with another group. So it's bringing people together and it's showing, it's demonstrating to people that the U3A is not just your local U3A. It's a family of U3As. We're, we're, a, we're an international organisation and so that's that's really what we have to plan for. And, and the, the other interesting group we've got, you know, if you don't want to come to the wall, there's a group of walkers in Scotland who say that they're going to walk the Antonine Wall. There's a lot of interest from walkers. We have more walking groups than any other group. So there's all sorts of walkers walking the wall and cyclists cycling the wall. And Keating. And if you're interested in taking part, just email the wall at u3a.org.uk. That's the wall at u3a.org.uk. And we stay in Northumberland because next month, on February the 8th, Philip Holdsworth from Penman Mauer U3A in North Wales will be giving an online talk called Before the Lindisfarne Gospels. Philip read Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic at Cambridge and had a career in archaeology. Since his retirement, he's taught courses on the Anglo-Saxon period including for the U3A at their National Summer School in Sirencester. 
The Lindisfarne Gospels, probably the most famous of all Anglo-Saxon artefacts, is an illuminated gospel book thought to have been produced around the years 715 to 720, and it's now in the British Library. But what happened before the Gospels? Ella Watts asked Philip to explain more. So my question will be, how did we get there? What went before? Um, I'll be looking at the very earliest ones. And although we think of these manuscripts as Anglo-Saxon, the, their origin is actually in Ireland. Because Ireland was practicing Christianity before the pagan Anglo-Saxons began to accept this new religion. And we see the very beginnings in manuscripts that uh, have survived from Ireland. And of course, when St. Columba founded his monastery on Iona, the island just off the west coast of Scotland, the, the, the scribes and illustrators were part of his retinue. And so in um, the, the seventh century, in fact, in the 630s, when King Oswald of Northumbria was seeking to promote Christianity in his kingdom, he invited people from Iona to establish a monastery in his kingdom. And that was the uh, monastery founded on the island of Iona. And to all intents and purposes, Lindisfarne was an Irish foundation in Northumbria. How did they get from Iona to Lindisfarne? Did they go across or did they go round the top? Would it be by sea or by land? They, they wouldn't have gone round the top, no. They, they would have um, gone over land from Iona uh, to Lindisfarne, yes, that's right. That was an amazing journey. Oh, yes. The, I mean, the journeys were incredible in this period. Anglo-Saxon England was pretty isolated from Europe and out of contact with uh, Italy uh, and with Christianity there, obviously during this pagan period from 400 through to um, 600. But by 670, people were regularly going to Rome from Northumbria. Benedict Biscop who was the founder of the famous monasteries Monk, Wearmouth and Jarrow, went six times in his lifetime. And of course, once the link with Rome were established, then pilgrimage was a big thing. And we get lots of people going on pilgrimage. The church's greatest was concern was about the nuns who wanted to go there, the women who wanted to travel. And the church was very concerned uh, in case they ran out of money and had to change profession. In fact, St. Boniface comments, he writes in a letter that he sent home, by the time we get to the second half of the seventh century, the Anglo-Saxons were very keen on promoting Christianity. And they looked to parts of their homelands in North Germany and South Denmark, where people were still pagan. So they went out as missionaries 75 years after they accepted Christianity. They were establishing monasteries on the continent. And just like the Irish ones were Irish foundations in Anglo-Saxon England, these were Anglo-Saxon foundations on the continent. Anyway, St. Boniface was one of these. They were desperate to be a martyr and was eventually slaughtered, much to his delight, um, at Dockham in southern Jutland. But uh, he wrote a letter home. And he said to the King of Mercia, then you've got to control this traffic of women wanting to go on pilgrimage to Rome. There is hardly a corner on the streets of the major cities here that don't have an Anglo-Saxon harlot. Just a tasty morsel of that Zoom talk by Philip Holsworth, which is free to U3A members and users of interest groups online. It's on Wednesday, February the 8th at 10 a.m., and if you'd like to reserve a spot, just go to u3a.org.uk forward slash learning. This time last year, COVID was still rife, you may remember, as we tried to combat the Omicron variant. During the height of the pandemic, a U3A member from Nutsford in Cheshire decided to design his own face mask for use in nearby residential homes. 
Adrian Fisher spent 40 years in the construction industry, but maybe his greatest achievement was after he retired. He explained to Val Dawson how the project got off the ground. Well, um, it came about, well, obviously, that at the time, uh, uh, residential homes in particular could not get PPE, um, protective personal equipment. Mm-hmm. And I was browsing through something on one of the 3D printer sites and up came this uh, design for a face mask. This is a, a transparent face mask, oh. not a uh, full face yeah. transparent face mask. Yeah. So I thought well, I could do that. So uh, I looked into it and talked to some friends at Cybar and other, other colleagues, uh, and they said that they'd support me uh, in terms of money mm. and a couple of them in terms of distribution. So it, I found a way of uh, actually sourcing the transparent plastic face mask part and then I was printing the rest of the thing that holds it on your head so it was the hardest work I'd ever done because I'd got three 3D printers running because 3D printers are fine but they take a long time to do anything so I'd got three of these running and uh, you can't coordinate when one stops and one starts so I was having to get up all through the night every two hours to, oh, no. to attend to my 3D printers. Anyway, in the end, we got, we printed 800, made 800 masks and got them out to 30 different residential homes and a couple of dentists. Fantastic. All in, in the Cheshire area, wasn't yes, it? Yes, all, all, all around Knutsford yeah. area. Yeah. Well, let's hope we never have to use them again. Well, no. maybe we will. Who knows? <laughs> well, I hope not. No. <laughs> but interestingly, the, the dent, I sent, some to my dentist in Ernston, uh, and he had bought some as, as prescribed by the dental authorities, uh, and he found that they were useless. And I sent him mine. He said they're fantastic. They're much better. Wow. And two years on, they still use them. Adrian Fisher, and Adrian wants to add that it was Paul Cooper who phoned all the care homes, and that he. And Trevor Nicholson did all the deliveries across Cheshire and Greater Manchester, which meant that the masks could be delivered free of charge. If you've checked your loose change recently, you may have found one of the new coins featuring King Charles. They are the latest addition to the Royal Collection at Windsor Castle. Next month, on Tuesday the 7th of February at 10am, one of the regular U3A Zoom talks will feature Jeremy Cheek, who was a volunteer there, as a specialist in coins and medals. He's a member of the Hastings and Rotha U3A, and he's been telling Joanne Watson about the origins of the collection. The man who started it was Charles I's elder brother, who most people haven't heard of, called Prince Henry. He spent far more on coins and medals than all the pictures and bronzes put together. Since then, it's had a very checkered history. And when George III died, he was very keen. He had 15,000 coins and medals. His son, George IV, who was rather profligate, known for enjoying himself, he gave away the entire collection to the state to pay off his gambling debts. So when subsequent monarchs bought things or were given things, they were literally put in the back of a cupboard and nobody knew what was there until my predecessor came along and offered to sort it out. And I continued the job of publishing it. The main thing that brings them to life is the the story behind them. That sounds very intriguing, Jeremy. Tell us a few of the uh, scandals, I should think, that are attached (laughs) to some of these coins and medals. What must be the most famous coins in the Royal Collection are the proposed coins for Edward VIII, who abdicated. The coins would have gone into production after two weeks when news broke of the impending abdication. So everything was hardly put away and forgotten about and the dice were melted. And it was only many years later when the deputy master of the Royal Mint died, people opened his private safe. They found this mysterious box labelled not to be opened except in the presence of two senior officials of the Royal Mint. And inside were six sets of the proposed coins for Edward VIII. So we can see what they actually would have looked like. One was given to the King George VI. When Edward VIII heard about it, he said, can I have a set? And the king, who was not best pleased with Edward VIII, said, 
no, you can't. In fact, they put them back in the safe and forgot about another 20 years, but they're now published. Looking on now, the website at some of the coins, there are hmm. things like groats. Now, I've heard of groats, and I'm sure anyone that's read Shakespeare would have probably heard of groats. But what was a groat? Well, it's a fourpenny piece. The most common coin was a silver penny, and a fourpenny piece would be a day's wages for a manual worker. So there was a very convenient denomination. Anything much bigger than that was, had a lot of value. There were sixpences and shillings, but a groat was very popular and it, had, it was big enough to have a, a reasonable image of the king on it. I've read stories of people trying to forge coins. Was yes. that easy to do? Well, it, it was in early days. People would take an original coin and make a mould from it and then do cast copies. The most obvious forgeries are fairly easy to detect, but they were endless, more sophisticated processes and uh, there's an endless battle between the forge of becoming more sophisticated and people trying to catch up with with what they are doing but uh, I don't think there are any forgeries in well not knowingly in the royal collection. <laughs> What's your favourite coin in there because as you mentioned there are thousands of them. It's a set of coins and medals and tokens which was supposed to have been the property of Bonnie Prince Charlie but nobody really had the courage to say, this is what it is. It's a very, very emotive subject to claim this is really it. But I proved what these items were. I researched the provenance. And it, it was a set of medals given by Bonnie Prince Charlie. He owned them personally to his private secretary. And these medals were sent around to their supporters as a, a, reminding them of the cause and criticising the government, rather satirical. So when he invaded again, they'd all rally around the course and join him and help him um, take over the throne again. One thing that you mentioned there was was medals as well as coins. Yeah. So is there um, maybe an original VC that Queen Victoria had a look at before they decided to present them to the to the heroes? Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're very pressing there. there. There is the original pattern design for a VC which was given to Queen Victoria. Say, so what do you think of this, madam? You know, and she said, well, not quite like this. This is made of copper, and when the troops polish it, it will go shiny, won't look good in their red tunics. It ought to be made of brass. And I think I should like to change the word for courage to for valour, and they made a few other changes to the design. But the very first pattern VC is in the Royal Collection. That is something that's in my book. There was one other particularly interesting one, General Robert Blake, who... Uh, won the Anglo-Dutch War, and he was very much the Nelson of his time. He was given a medal, and only three of these large gold medals survived. It's a beautiful uh, engraving of a battle scene. And the one that was given to him uh, is in the Royal Collection. It has a long provenance going back all the way to the, the 17th century. So that's one of the other prized objects. Having heard that George IV, who was short of a few bob, sold off <laughs> most of the Royal Collection. Of course, there is that hidden hoard somewhere in the River Wash, isn't there, from King John, who lost all the, the treasures and things like that. So there must be a few coins out there that the Royal Collection would love to see come to the fore. Uh, well, metal detectorists are digging them up all the time, they buy the hundred every day, uh, and they all have to be declared now treasure trove. Occasionally, somebody gives one to uh, the Royal Collection. There's a Celtic coin, which was dug up in Hampshire and they said, look what we found. But uh, the main emphasis is on conservation rather than accumulation these days. But I know Prince William and Prince Harry were both uh, interested in coins, so it may be in, in the future the emphasis will change. Jeremy Cheek. And if you want to attend Jeremy's Zoom talk, which is free to U3A members and users of interest groups online, it's on Tuesday morning, February the 7th at 10 o'clock. To reserve a spot, go to u3a.org.uk forward slash learning. And the book that Jeremy referred to is called Monarchy, Money and Medals. It's published by Spink in association with the Royal Collection Trust and is available through Amazon. And that's it for this episode. But don't forget, you're always welcome to get in touch. Maybe you've recently fulfilled a long held ambition or you've started an unusual group or perhaps you'd like to nominate someone from your U3A who has a story to tell. We'd love to hear from you. Our email address is communications at u3a.org.uk. My thanks to Joanne Watson, Val Dawson, 
Sarah Goodall and Ella Watts for the interviews and also to Ella for producing the podcast. Until next time, this is Nick Bailey saying goodbye.